I'm interviewing Ralph Russell, former library director. Um, and uh, Ralph, just so you know, this call is being recorded as part of our or oral history project for our 50th anniversary. Um, just making sure that you're aware you are being recorded. Thank you. Um, so my first question for you is, when were you hired and how long were you at Georgia State University? I was hired in September of 1975, and I retired March 1st, 1997. So I was there approximately 22 years. Wow. Um, and can you confirm your position and your responsibilities during your 22 years? My position title was university librarian. I was responsible for the university library, but not the slide collection library in the art department. That was pretty voluminous. When the law school was begun, I was responsible for the collection development and the initial setting up of that library before the law librarians were hired. And I was involved in evaluating and selecting candidates both for the director of the library and for the librarian positions. So, Ralph, it, that means that the law library was never officially part of the university library. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Um, so Although what the library, excuse me, the librarians in the law library had faculty rank in the university library. And so the they, came to, they came to library faculty meetings and participated fully, and we had a great relationship. Do you know at what point that, that stopped? What stopped? Um, that the law librarians participated in the, the library faculty? Well, when I left, they were still members of the library faculty, so... No, I don't know when it stopped. Okay. Um, what attracted you to the position and Georgia State University? Well, there were two things that were involved. I had been a librarian at the University of Georgia before I entered the Ph.D. program, so I knew something about Atlanta. There were really three things involved. Number two, the salary was terrific. It was far more than many library administrators and university librarians were making at the time. And the guy who was my mentor, who was dean of libraries at the University of Georgia, Porter Kellum, called me when they first advertised the position and he said, Ralph, this would be a wonderful position for you because this institution is going to be taking off like a rocket. So with those kinds of support, I applied, was invited for an interview, came with five-year-old child and wife from Greenville, North Carolina, where I was working at the time. And of course, I left my suit, suits in a suit bag on the carport where we lived in North Carolina, arrived in Atlanta Saturday afternoon with no suits and the interviews were to start Monday morning. So I scrambled to riches, found a suit that I liked. They could get it altered by closing that day, bought several shirts and ties, and set out. And I told the crew, everybody I interviewed with on Monday, that I hope they liked my suit because I didn't have any other change of clothes. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so what was it like uh, at Georgia State when you worked here, and what were special collections and the library like specifically? I want to be diplomatic about this. Uh, my predecessor was pretty much an authoritarian, and the library staff were amazed that someone would listen to them on anything. 
When I went to work there, special collections consisted of the Southern Labor Archives, period. And it was housed on one of the floors in the Urban Life Center in several rooms. It consisted of an archivist and a library assistant. Uh, It was pretty much neglected, special collections. The library, I thought, had tremendous potential. And in surveys at the time, we could document that there were 7,000 people a day in and out of the university library, and many of those were not affiliated in any way with Georgia State University. So in the viewpoint of some, those people were not part of our mission because they were not Georgia State staff, students, or faculty. Viewed by others, uh, it was a publicly supported institution, and you could make an argument that as publicly supported, they were entitled to come in and use the materials and the resources there. That was a continuing tension my whole time at Georgia State. Uh, I don't think the special collections, aside from occasional glance, was viewed or supported by the university initially. Wow. I'm going to get to another question about that a little later. Um, but I'd like to know how how was, um, and you kind of touched on this already, how was special collections viewed and supported or not by the university during your time? Well, let me tell you about the Mercer collection. George Manners was dean of the business school. He was a native of Savannah. Johnny Mercer came from Savannah, and through Savannah Connections, George and Claire Manners um, were friends of Johnny and Ginger Mercer. And George Manners called me several times, wanting me to accept a gift from Mrs. Mercer. Johnny Mercer had died. Among other things, she was going to give his Oscar to the university, and I declined. I declined because I didn't want to be saddled with a single room that housed an exhibit in the library. If it were part of a larger collection and we could set that forth as a a mission for special collections, that would be more accepted. I told George more than once, if I accepted it, it would have to be with the assurance from the university administration we would have funding to develop that as a special collections. Well, George bypassed me and went to the executive vice president, Bill Suttles, and talked him into accepting the gift. So it was a fait accompli. Uh, Mrs. Mercer was excited that we were going to accept the Oscar and other memorabilia and we had to find a place in Library North. That was the only library we had at the time. So we found a room, and we were desperate for space at the time, but we dedicated a room. The university provided the money to have it rehabilitated and designed and outfitted as an exhibit area, and we installed it. But then after that, it was a difficult to get motivation to start using that as a linchpin. As luck would have it, uh, through at Mrs. Mercer's death, she came several times to visit while she was alive, and we always hosted her. I had lunch, dinner, or whatever, anytime she came. When she died, I was one of the eulogists at her funeral in Savannah at the Civic Center. But in her will, she left us a portion of the income that comes through the Mercer Foundation. And that was really the beginning, I think, of the movement to expand special collections to be more than just the Southern Labor Archives. And what you are managing at present is far more than that. But the beginnings were a little bit harem scarum and a little scary because we were doing with lean budgets 
space was always a problem, both for the university library collections and for special collections. I never successfully procured and outfitted an off-campus storage site, which we badly needed. Uh, what questions would you have from what I've said so far? I guess based on the previous question and this question, um, where does university archives fit into that picture? Well, we had a, an entrepreneurial head of special collections named Les Huff. And Dr. Huff had a doctorate in labor history, and he was um, very good at establishing, maintaining, and enhancing relationships, not only with the labor community, but he immediately saw his mandate and agreed with me that we needed to broaden the scope of special collections. And under Les's leadership, we ultimately acquired the O'Neill Photograph Collection, the Women's Collection. We expanded what we were collecting in the way of popular music. Uh, our rare book collection, is, as I recall, was not very much, but we added somewhere in the late 1980s or early 1990s the millionth volume. And I'm pretty sure, my memory's not sharp on this, but I procured a donor who gave the money to buy a first edition of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and that was our millionth volume. And we paid James McGregor Burns to come to campus, and he delivered the millionth volume lecture. And I thought that was a significant event, only because university libraries usually number their collections in the millions of pieces or millions of volumes. But we had finally reached that threshold. Ralph, um, <clears throat> just getting back to the the university archives, did the uh, having the university archives? Uh, I'm assuming within special collections, is my understanding. Um, did that help at all, um, or did that garner any support or goodwill with the university? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about um, with the millionth volume, but were there any other major events or momentous occasions when you worked here? Well, I think, I don't know that it was university-wide, but as we nickeled and dined our way on the library endowment fund, I spent a lot of time and effort courting the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I turned in a proposal for, I don't know, four years, five years, before I finally got something funded. And every time they rejected a proposal, I would take the proposal and I would fly to Washington and I would go over it with a programming officer. And finally, one of them suggested to me that I have the proposal I submit edited and reviewed by a successful applicant to the endowment, the humanities, which I did. And that time, I got it funded. And then we had a four-year grant, three- or four-year grant, to raise matching money, three to one which is a large lift in anybody's book. So I was cast into the fundraising effort, competing with everybody from Agnes Scott to Clark Atlanta University, primarily with local foundations. And for the first years of that grant, we raised relatively little money. It was not terribly successful. But as luck would have it, one of my workout buddies who had been dean of the College of Education came in as acting president. And I went to see Sherb Day, one of his first days in office, and I described and outlined this grant 
what it would mean to the university library going forward, how important it was that we fulfill the requirements of the grant, which gave us credibility with other funding entities. Well, Sherm came through and he announced to the Council of Deans soon after that the university, one of the university priorities with all the local foundations was the University Library Endowment for the Humanities Grant until we got that sucker funded. Needless to say, I was jubilant. And we did successfully fund the matching portion of that grant. And what you look at now as the University Endowment was, it went, I think when I left, it was somewhere between three and four million dollars. And of course, we started it with a $25 check from a faculty member. And we nickels and dimed it in many ways. Every way we could find to make a little bit of money, we did. Uh, that was a significant challenge, partly because it was not entirely within my ken or my power to do that. I had to have somebody go to bat for it. And how fortunate that somebody I knew well enough to talk plainly and realistically with got in the position of president. I think that rings true for many of us. Um, so, Ralph, um, this kind of gets to, again, something you, you touched on earlier. What was the space like? Uh, were you here for any one or more of the moves or space reorganizations? And this is the library well, generally. I was responsible for the planning for Library South, and it was a nightmare from beginning to end. First off, we had to get it put on the university's construction priority list, and then we had to negotiate it up to the first top tier of the Board of Regents. That took several years. It didn't happen quickly. And then when we got to planning the building, the Board of Regents physical facilities person said that they were not willing to build a bridge over Decatur Street between the two buildings. We would just have to have separate entrances. And I had a fit over that. And he was not going to budge, and I couldn't get the university administration to challenge him on his statement. So I hired a library consultant from another university library with credibility and a track record and he came in and wrote a report that said it would not be functional to have two separate buildings housing one library, that the number of entrances and exits would be uncontrollable, and it would not function as a single library. That report managed to get the support from the person who was the university Oh, gosh, my boss, Vice President for Academic Affairs at the time, and he got behind me on it, and we managed to talk the university in administration into addressing it with the Board of Regents staff, and they first said it would cost an extra $500,000 to build that bridge, and we responded with it would not be a library without the bridge. It would be two buildings and two libraries. And we finally won that tussle. So there always was a bridge between Library North and Library South? That's right. The building opened with that bridge intact on the third, fourth, and fifth floors. Okay. And do you know of any major changes or improvements to special collections um, during your time at Georgia State, including any moves or space changes? Well, like I said, I never got the off-campus storage that we needed for both the Lee University Library and for special collections. But in planning the building, Library South, we early on identified the seventh floor as the home for archives and special collections. 
And I thought that was a major improvement, both in the housing of the collections, the use of the collections, and the exhibit space. And it all it all provided a very attractive venue for library-related events. Absolutely. We use it all the time. <laughs> yeah, and, and part of the problem was fighting off people who wanted to use it for non-library events. We still have that problem. I guess that will endure forever. <laughs> um. Were there any major challenges you faced during your time at Georgia State related specifically to special collections? Well, I described for you the issue of, of the Mercer gift. Mm -hmm. I think because Wes Huff was very adept at relationships, whatever issues may have come up, I think he pretty much resolved those. And if he needed to involve me, he did. And we had a good working relationship in that we communicated frequently. It wasn't official all the time, but we talked several times a week at least. Uh, and I found that very helpful because he did his damnedest to keep me informed and keep me informed of issues he was dealing with. Yeah, I think um I think that strong working relationship goes a long way. Oh, absolutely. And his successor was Julia Young. And although yes. I had a good relationship with her, it was not the kind of total communication that Les and I had. And I don't know that it was her fault. It may have been my fault. I don't know. True. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's just a change in communication style. Absolutely. So my next question for you is, did you face any opposition or challenges to special collections and archives from the university administration, or was the administration generally supportive? And again, you, you sort of touched on this, so I don't know if you have anything further to add. I don't have anything further to add, except that I had the great luck to work for several top-notch vice presidents for academic affairs who let me write the whatever I needed. I mean, the money was not unlimited, but they were willing to grant me whatever I needed. For instance, I was very involved for a period of years with OCLC, Users Council, Board of Trustees, uh, the vice president at that time literally said, do whatever you need to get this done. He understood the importance of that organization to libraries worldwide and that my position being on the governing board was important and that we needed to support me in whatever I needed. So I, I did have that kind of support for which I'm very grateful and many of my colleagues in library administration did not have. For instance, when I came, I said, I want to be put on the fast track for tenure. And I was put on fast track for tenure and nobody ever challenged it. Thanks, thank you, Ralph. Um, can you think a little bit more broadly now um, and give us sort of an overall picture of what the campus itself was like at Georgia State University? So kind of getting outside the library, generally what was the campus environment like? Well, you know about Kell Hall. Yep. And I can't remember anything that I would comment on what the campus was like. I'm thinking about, you know, I, I, can, I can tell you that 
No, that's not right. I can't make statements I'm not sure of. So you touched a little bit upon, you know, who was using the library and special collections. Can you comment sort of on uh, the how the campus changed over time in terms of number of students, type of students, uh, growth, anything along those lines? I'm thinking. No, I don't have anything else to say. Okay. Um, in terms of the evolution of special collections and archives, were there any new positions added during your time? Did the department grow? Um, were there any like structural changes that you remember? Well, yes, definitely the department grew because when I went there, it was an archivist and a library assistant. And when I left, I think we had five or six professional slots and maybe five or six uh, support staff. But it also was during my time there, we got away from requiring an ALA accredited master's degree to have a faculty position because we hired an electrical engineer master's degree holder for technology for instance, and we also had archivists and special collections people with master's degrees in related fields, but not in librarianship. And that was very sensible in my view, because what was needed for what they were doing was the kind of preparation they had. So all of that happened during the 22 years I was there. Yeah, and I think we're about the same staffing-wise still. Um, Even see. with the expansion of collections and you still have the same staff? Yes, so there are uh, six archivists. Um, five of them hold uh, curatorial positions. Uh, uh, one of them, Bill Hardesty, has been um, primarily in charge of um, collections management for the department, so processing and, and cataloging of collections. Um, so, and then we have uh, a handful of staff positions, and I recently lost one a couple of years ago when somebody retired. Gosh. We could use more. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, let's see, where am I? <laughs> uh, so during your time, uh, what were the department priorities for special collections and did they change? And again, you spoke a little bit on this, so I don't know if you have anything further. No, and it went from Southern Labor Archives into an expanded view of special collections. Of which Southern Labor Archives was a part. Right, uh, and it's still the largest. Um, what what are, or sorry, excuse me, what were your priorities, um, if, if you had anything beyond this, uh, specific to special collections and archives? Did you have anything further? No, except that, as I said, in relationship to the offered Mercer gift, I didn't want us to be a museum piece. I wanted us, if we took the Mercer materials, that it be part of an organic collection that would grow and develop because it didn't make any sense to have a one-room museum. Right. Well, Ralph, I think that's all I have for you today is it do you have anything further that you would like to tell us about the last thing you listed is where did you go after GSU oh yeah you're right I had one more question and I, I consulted for four years and then I took a half-time position with the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools colleges and universities.
and it was a delightful job. It was proof that I could do something other than librarianship. I wrote letters for the executive officer of that association. I was back up for the traveling staff. It was a half-time job, and I loved it, and I did that for 13 years. I retired from that four years ago, five years ago. Wow. So you your career extended well beyond Georgia State then? Yes. I had worked, I guess, 15 years before I went to Georgia State, and then I worked 13 years after I left. Wow. Ralph, it was really great talking to you today, and um, I look forward to having more conversations with you. Oh, I do, too. I do, too, Christina. Good luck to you, and I look forward to meeting you sometime. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Ralph.